Great relationships don't just happen. They're designed. Why leave love to chance when you can make strategic decisions in your relationship just like you do in your career? The days of settling for mediocre are over. Welcome to the Project Relationship Podcast. I'm Dr. Jolie Hamilton. And I'm Ken Hamilton. Join us as we explore the decisions and choices that make relationships work no matter what life throws your way. It's time to reimagine relationships from the ground up. Welcome to Project Relationship. Hi, and welcome to the Project Relationship Podcast. I'm Dr. Jolie Hamilton. And I'm Ken Hamilton. And today we're talking about a frequently asked question, a question that is, it comes up for us because we are consensually non-monogamous, but also because I happen to work largely with clients who want a healthy, functional, consensually non-monogamous relationship. And that question is really straightforward. It's how do I how do I get from here to there? So how do I bring up wanting a consensually non-monogamous relationship to my partner? When you and I first got together, we did it one way. So I don't want anybody to think that we did this well. We No. <laughs> we did don't, not. Don't be like, hey, that's a good way. I'll do that. But I think it's important that we share some of the stories yeah. of what happened to us and why, why I feel so strongly about some of the steps we can take. There's no right way to bring up CNM with your partner, but there are some ways that will be, that are more conducive to productive conversation. And so that's what I want to focus on today. What, what could get us into the most productive possible conversation? Really, no matter what kind of relationship style you have right, right now. Um, so the first thing that comes up for me when I think about making the transition from monogamy to consensual non-monogamy is, do you know what your monogamy is? Do you currently know? And if you've listened to some of the episodes we've done on relationship agreements, you know that we feel very strongly <laughs> about getting explicit on oh, yes. what your relationship agreement is or agreements. This is a, it's a living, breathing, not, it's not even a document. I mean, it may be a document, but your relationship agreement is the conversation of your relationship. It's the conversations. It's a shared vision that changes over time. And... In many ways, it is the relationship. Yeah. When, when people are coming to me asking me, how do I get from monogamy to consensual non-monogamy? I, I, one of my first questions is always, well, what's the culture of talking? What's the culture oh, of discussion? Yeah. How does your household, how does your, how does your relationship work now? Because, well, we, we had different households we did. prior to this. Very we different. each had a first marriage. Um, mine was monogamous. Yours was monogamous on face, but not in action. Like right. it, it kind of looked monogamous from the outside, but, but both of us had, there was a, an issue that we learned about up close, mm -hmm. which was that we couldn't talk about everything. Right. It yeah, was, was... anti-cultural. It was like the, the wrong thing to do. So yeah. what is your current relationship to talking? <laughs> like, what is it like to bring up an uncomfortable topic? Or what is it like to talk about something that you don't know your partner, your partner's feelings or thoughts on. So in your first marriage, what was it like to bring up something that had never been spoken about before? Well, uh, we had a very, a very simple and straightforward way of addressing that. We didn't. You just, it was <laughs> it just, just a flat out no. It, it, uh, you know, you asked the question Those that way. Those conversations must have gotten really circular and boring after a while. Well, you heard some of them. I did hear some <laughs> of them. They were. Um, you asked it as how to bring up, how did we bring up a new topic that hadn't been talked about before? And in our particular relationship, uh, we kind of, we, we explicitly didn't. There was like a, there was like this area, this time at the beginning of the relationship where we would talk about some things and then it's like the relationship set. Oh, and then so that was it. There was, yeah. Um, or clay. You can't put or concrete extra 
fruit into the jello. No, after you can't. It's set. Um, Interesting. So it was. Am I fruit in your jello? That's weird. <laughs> okay. I. You're fruity. I am. Um, it's true. We, in my marriage, my first marriage, there wasn't the, there wasn't like a, a set of topics. That's not what created. But you talked about your relationship. We at all. I, did. I mean, some. I did. Mm -hmm. You did. I did. You did. Okay. I was married to somebody who didn't like to talk, and I'll grant him this. That's exactly what he promised me. Like I, that was on a beat and switch. He wasn't a talker, and I thought I was okay with that. Turns out I wasn't. And it was actually a really big, it was um, a deal breaker problem for me as it turns out. But, but we did, it was okay to talk about most things. However, it still wouldn't be what I would call a culture of making everything talk about mm -hmm. Um, we, where we fell down was in really supporting each other and creating a, a, a safe container to have a, a crucial conversation, to have a conversation that probably was going to raise up some feelings or whatever. We didn't have a method. We didn't have a way to do that. So sometimes I would bring something new up and it would go great. And, and he was there for it. We could talk about anything and sometimes totally the opposite. Which, I mean, yeah. I, I've done some pretty funny storytelling on stage about okay. totally the opposite. So I, I do want to say I, I oversimplified because what you described is is actually how it would go. One of us would bring up a topic, but there was no attention paid to what's the context? Is this a good time? Are we both in a good spot to have this conversation? None at all. The assumption was actually that everything could be talked about under any circumstances, which I don't think is what you're talking about. When you say everything is talk about it, so not not just like out of the blue, right? So thank you for asking me to clarify that. So I really am thinking about the intention behind these these kind of um, foundational conversations. So a relationship agreement conversation, definitely, like that is a foundational relationship conversation. Mm -hmm. I want people to set themselves up for success when you're going to have that that conversation. So in other words physically emotionally um are you ready to have a conversation have you have you checked for halt hungry angry lonely tired have you made sure that one of you doesn't have like a huge work deadline the next morning right. and is going to cause a problem if you if you stay up an extra hour all of those things set yourself up for success in the in the physical and emotional realms and then know what you want going in. Oh. If so often we go into a conversation and we'll think about the outcome we want, but we don't think about how we want to feel in the conversation. This has happened to me, even with you, even as recently as like last week where I've gone in hoping to convince you of something. Like I'm in a sales pitch mode. I'm like, mm -hmm. I'm going to sell you on this idea. But instead of focusing on when I focus on the outcome that I want and I don't focus on how we want to feel during the conversation, there's a, there's discomfort that comes up. There's like a, it's the conversation yeah. isn't as fun as it could be. Oh, that's a great thought. Yeah. So how do you make the conversation as fun as it can be? As, right. Which not, I mean, not every conversation is super fun. You and I have had conversations about death, about um, our wills, about like yeah, a, stuff that all sorts of like, that's not fun. Fun, but uh, presumably a conversation about CNM would be with the intention of having more fun. Right. So um, why not make the conversation as much fun as it could be? Right. So one of the ways that I have shifted that in our relationship is to, to change the context that we're having the conversation in. So in other words, we've got, we get into habits, we get into those habits of like, this is where we talk, this is where we hang out. And a certain mood will kind of inhabit that space in our house. And if I want to have a conversation that's sort of an edge dwellers conversation, it's it's at the edges of what we know as a couple or what we know as our relationship, then changing the context and letting something new enter our, our experience is really helpful. So going for a walk. Yeah. How do you decide what a good context is for a conversation that you're going to have? So 
I have two rules of thumb that I use. And I use them with you all the time. You probably will recognize them when I say them. Um, if I think it is a conversation that's going to be particularly tender, I try to make sure that we are sitting on the same side so that we're sitting together. Well, as we are right now, we're sitting next to each other, next but to each facing. other, but turned at a, at a, like a uh, yeah. 45 degree angle sort of to each other. So we're on the same side and within touching range so yeah. that I can maintain um, physical contact when it's appropriate and necessary for, for comfort. And just to remind you that I'm here. The other is um, if it's a conversation where I think we're going to need to problem solve, then get us up and moving. Change the context in a way that gets us moving and has us in our creative um, minds. And cool. that often is enough to just break the, uh, yeah, like the, the cycle that we're currently in. And that's really, really helpful. So that's just some of the basic, like, how do I set up to have a successful conversation? The other thing I would say is <laughs> so frequently I hear people going into these conversations presuming that they're going to get a negative answer. I'm not much for like super woo-woo, I can manifest anything I want, but I do believe that what we put our attention toward is more likely to come our way. So if you go into a conversation about consensual non-monogamy thinking, there's no way they're going to go for this. Um, this is just, this is going to be tragic and it's going to start a fight. Well, you're probably going to bring some of that energy into it yourself. Yeah. And it only takes a little bit of that negative, like combative energy to turn the tide of a sensitive conversation. Yeah. So you could be entering sort of in enemy status rather than, hey, I have a thing I want to talk to you about. And it might be a little scary for one or both of us, but I'd like to talk to you about it. I think that just reminding myself that we're on the same team. That's what I, yeah. So you were talking about coming in and not, not like creating enemy state status right out of the gate with, with the, like we have a, we have a kid who's very good at this at asking questions that are, that, that are inclined, they incline <laughs> you to answer the way he wants. Yes. And if you, if you go to your partner and say, so I've been thinking about, you know, maybe we date other people. How much do you hate that? <laughs> you know, <laughs> that's mean... a different question from a, so you and I were, this is where we are in our relationship. We're doing, you know, I think things are going really well. And I think it might be fun to, now you've got a different right. situation. I think it might be fun too. So now we get into the nitty gritty. Mm -hmm. I think it might be fun to what? Yes. What is your current knowledge base about consensual non-monogamy? And there's a bit of a catch-22 here, because if you get super educated about the topic without any practical experience, but you're, you know, you, you have educated yourself, you've done your reading, and then you're trying to bring your partner on, that can, that can sometimes backfire because you might have a really clear idea of exactly what you want before they've even gotten a chance to like wrap their brain around, what did you just say? You want to have sex with who and the what and the where now? So I think that there's actually a sweet spot. And the sweet spot probably has something to do with like level setting together a little bit. Introducing yeah. the idea um, as soon as you can, as soon as you can courageously bring some part of you to your partner and say, Wow, that's a concept I had never thought about. I don't even know whether I want it, but could we explore it as a as a thought experiment at least? That that's a it helps it helps. It's not always possible. Sometimes you've been thinking about this for years and this is that's just where you are and you may have a lot of knowledge and in that case I would I would say be patient. Remember that you may have spent years thinking about this and they're getting brand new information. Yeah, um, the my imagination was stretched in a particular direction when we first got together that yours hadn't been. I'd had some experiences that, that affected the way I thought about it. You so significant. So you had had a consensually non-monogamous relationship. It was a don't ask, don't tell policy, which isn't what I typically recommend or hope for for people. But that that's definitely very different. I had been in a very ownership model. 
-hmm. relationship. Yeah, that was so just the notion, just the idea that when I fell in love with you, it wasn't going to be the end of the world. The fact that you, that, wow, that it, it blew my mind. It blew my mind. And starting off level setting with your partner on that imagination, uh, that could be quite a few conversations right up front. Which brings us to another important piece. Your why your reason mm. for wanting to explore consensual non-monogamy. It might be philosophical. It might feel like, well, this is actually just me. This is part of my, like who I am. This is my orientation to the world. And so I just want to share this with my partner. Um, it might, on the other hand, be about a specific person. If there's already somebody in your sights that you're like, yeah, I want that person in my life. And that's how you bring the conversation to a currently monogamous agreement that you have. It is, it is typical that that will be met with some surprise and potentially some big feelings around some big feelings that can, that can go in ways that are hard to predict. And I know this from experience. When I fell in love outside of my marriage, I was so starry eyed that I didn't see how shocked I didn't see the cold bucket of ice water that was going to be thrown all over my current husband when I was like, Oh my God, I love this guy so much. He's so awesome. Because I was just starry eyed and I was like, well, whatever. It couldn't be that bad. Like it's love. Yeah. That's not how he felt it. And I, I, I feel a lot of things about how I was. Uh, it didn't mean harm. But my impact, my impact was to be this shocking bucket of ice water that he was not expecting and neither one of us knew what to do with. So that's the story. My, the lesson I learned from it is that if there's a person, an individual person that you're hoping to to either begin to have sex with or begin to have a romantic relationship with or something. If that's what you're thinking about, I caution, I just want to offer caution that that can become very specific and it can easily become an, uh, the wrong focus can be placed. Yeah. Right? A, a conversation about non-monogamy is already, can already be a little threatening to, oh, am I not enough for you? There you go. And if there is someone else in the picture already that's part of this picture you're bringing your partner, that's just going to exacerbate that. So say more about that. The feeling of insecurity yeah, so, um, is a big one. It is. You. Um, so uh, there I am. And uh, you are currently sitting next to me um, looking for a date. Yes. Well, not have, right now, but definitely last night. This is a scenario <laughs> that happens frequently. And and depending on my mood, I can be completely comfortable with that. Or I can be thinking, well, so are you are you trying to avoid some parts of me that that don't work well for you? Or are you looking for something else to replace me? You know, you go into the the real um, or am I missing the real something? monstery parts of my myself? Or are you missing something that I can't, you know, so it's so much about me, yeah. what I'm thinking about in those moments. And the, the fact that everything is talk aboutable here means I can say that because you'll know I'm not asking you to stop. I'm just telling you this is what's going on for me. So after long years of practice, we've developed the ability to say, this is what I'm feeling. I'm feeling insecure. And it, that's not your problem. Mm -hmm. I don't need right. you to stop what you're doing. But that said, <laughs> at the beginning of the discussions of consensual non-monogamy, you've got, you've got stuff to unpack. There, there are ideas like that what has been holding up your relationship so far, the idea of um, 
<laughs> what is our monogamy? What is our agreement? Who do we have sex with? Who do we have children with? How do we, um, how do we spend our Friday nights? How do we share our finances? And that's what allows me to know that we can have the conversation because I know what our relationship is. We've talked about it. We've, we have a relationship agreement. We've changed it over time. I know what our why is for our relationship. So when I get into that, I can trust that we're going to have the conversation. Defenses will come up, but we know about that. And we, we, uh, we know we're going to be sitting through some discomfort. Yeah. So when you're trying to have this conversation, the other thing I would caution is it is possible to try too hard. It, this is a place where I have, I've seen people venture past, um, introducing a topic and into coercion, Oh. intentional coercion. Yeah. Um, this is a very tricky, very, very sensitive and nuanced topic because asking for something and coercion are like, they come dangerously close. There's a, there's a very fine line. And yet if, if we step over into coercive behavior, we are by definition being antithetical to the values of consent to the values of conscious relating. And so we got to deal with the coercion piece. Yeah. Do you have a, a straightforward answer to the question of when does uh, convincing become coercion? Because, okay, so I come to you with an idea and you're like, well, I don't know. And then I start selling it to you. Well, I think for one thing, if there, if I am giving um, the idea of consequences or ramifications, mm -hmm. If you don't adhere to my idea, we're, we're there. If, if now I am going to give, on the other hand, life has natural consequences. So this can confuse people because mm -hmm. if you're stating a, well, you know, it, uh, <laughs> that for instance, um, when we're negotiating barrier, barrier use during sex, like there are natural consequences to not using barriers during penetrative yeah sex right so there are clinical realities that right so there play. are these realities but there are also a lot of um consequences that you can manufacture so you could manufacture the consequence of if you don't do this i will leave you <laughs> for a simple <laughs> example for a simple straightforward yeah. example um on the other hand <laughs> a reality of adult relationships is there is always a level of insecurity in them. We, we are adults. You and I are individuals in a relationship, not the hey. day I no longer feel safe saying to you with deep love and affection, I will leave you if you harm me is the day I'm no longer in accordance yeah. with my own values. Yep. And that is a challenging thing yeah. to, to accept in this culture, the way we're taught, there's this like immense pressure on forever. Mm -hmm. And I have come to deeply value no for as long as we can treat each other in ways that, that are prioritizing growth and love and care for ourselves as well as each other. And that means balancing a, a, a tricky mix of stuff. Yeah. So for us, with that being the, the core of our relationship, the growth and the trust and the love and the care, the non-monogamy, um, it, uh, it, we, we look for how it fits into that. And if, if there are aspects, I don't know if I'm headed in the right direction here, but if there are aspects of that, that aren't in line with our values, then we talk about it. Right. So there's the thing coming back to your values. This is why it's, it's a wonderful thing. If you can start your relationship or wherever you are in your relationship, if you can start having conversations about values, about your individual values, mm -hmm. and then your, your purpose together, a discussion about what your monogamy looks like and whether there is 
um, consensual monogamy, non-monogamy, or just creative versions of monogamy. Mm -hmm. Because in fact, we all have our own version of monogamy. Um, we can do that. We can co-create something that works for us from a place where we're taking seriously the fact that we're individuals with our with right. values. And so something that you and I have agreed on as a, as a core value, we happen to have this in, in accordance with each other is, um, valuing autonomy yeah. and agency. You didn't really like agency when we <laughs> no. were first together. That, <laughs> that really wasn't my you thing. You well, I have to autonomy. do stuff. No, autonomy is great, but I have to do stuff. When, took we, me a little while. when we started talking about values and we both realized, oh yeah, we both value autonomy. We both value the, the idea that as, as conscious adults, we are, we are responsible for and to ourselves and to our community. But agency means, yeah, and you get to choose. You get to decide. Mm -hmm. You get to choose. And we each carry an immense amount of privilege, which means we have a lot of responsibility right. to choose well. And I said you didn't take it well because I remember talking to you about agency oh, and yeah. you throwing fists oh, about yeah. that. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Not literally, but well, maybe literally against the punching bag. It's possible. Possibly. Because you felt so disempowered from where you were. Yeah. And so we weren't negotiating. Um, we weren't even negotiating really heavy stuff. That was just like day to day no, no, it was, responsibility. It was simple stuff. So if this had been about our, our monogamy or, or non monogamy, I could imagine it being even harder. Having the shared value of agency has been really helpful to us when we come back and we have these conversations about, okay, so um, we have agreed to be non-monogamous. Cool. What does that look like when it comes to time? How much time away from the home can each of us spare? How much time away from the kids? depending on what age they are, that yep. has been very, very different. And one that I find particularly interesting is how much money is it okay to spend yeah, on, that... on dating, on, on being in other relationships? And you and I have separate bank accounts and together bank accounts, but it's still a thing. It is. And I, I love that that's the level of detail that you and I talk about this at, because in- well, my... You know how I love detail. You do. And in, in my last marriage, we just kind of let stuff happen. The, the, the intentionality is just so refreshing. And well, do you know why, you know why I care so much about you having a specific amount and me having a specific amount that's already budgeted for that we're like this, this is what fits into the budget and anything beyond that we have to talk about in our, in our financial discussions. Mm -hmm. It's because when you and I were first dating, I remember overhearing the arguments you would have oh. with your wife yeah. about taking me to dinner and f having that sort of suck all of the, the oxygen out of the room I was in because I did not want to feel like I did not mean for that to happen. I didn't yeah. know. And I felt no, I didn't know how to make it better. I didn't know what to do. And it was years later that I realized when you and I were dating independently that I realized that the problem wasn't the money. The problem was that we didn't, you didn't have a way to have that conversation. Yeah. So it wasn't an agreement. So no matter what you did with me, it could be wrong. Right. It's not just yeah. about what's allowed. I, so without with the... great big air quotes around the word allowed. Thank you very much. But yeah. How do you even know where to begin having the conversations unless you start? Without the explicit conversations and agreements, my experience was that the conversation was kicked around by the feelings and emotions of the moment, not about any shared concepts, values, agreements that we'd had. And and then... Say it again louder for the people in yeah. back. This is a big deal. Yep. Without... Some people... Some people, many people, many of us are largely working from a, a feelings place, an emotions place. Feelings yeah. are great. I mean, I do. Uh, yeah, feelings what I are offer, awesome. Well, and, we're, and we're all moody. Like every human has moods. I'm tremendously moody. They come and go as they will. But you, you pointed out to me how the effect, the impact that it had on you that you didn't know how to count on 
your relationship because it was all about what mood, yep. what emotion was happening then. And so any agreement that had made, been made before didn't it could matter. Change it could just because change. Because of the feelings of the moment. Yeah. Can you give an example of how that might have played out? Because I think it's important. Honestly, I think the, the money one that you just talked about is perfect. Um, in a previous moment when everything was calm and, and happy, um, the same conversation would have been, sure, go ahead. But I mean, it's, you said, set up to, for success, you know, make sure nobody's hungry, angry, lonely, tired. This is why, because when those things come into play, all of a sudden, those feelings of stress and tension can come out feeling like, no, no, you can't do that. I don't want you to do that when that wasn't the agreement before. Okay. I want to wrap up this episode yeah. with something super important that came up in my, when you said that I was thinking, okay, we could probably have summed up this whole episode by starting at the beginning with, how do you feel about asking forgiveness versus asking permission? <laughs> okay. Okay. When you and I started uh -huh. our, our physical relationship, something really remarkable happened for me. And it, it wasn't, I mean, it was good, but it was. <laughs> but that's not what you're talking about. <laughs> no. Okay. I understood. It was that I found out that you had been operating under explicit instructions, maybe the only explicit instructions there had been in yeah. your household that, that it was way better. It was far preferable to ask forgiveness for having taken some ac action than to just have the conversation ahead of time. Yeah. And the shorthand for that is ask forgiveness, not permission. But I, I think it's important to say, we don't mean permission like, are you allowed to do this? It's the discussion. It's the conversation yeah. about what are we doing? What are our values? What is our agreement? So when you and I first had, um, well, yeah, when, when we first fluid bonded, yeah. that when we first fluid bonded, I, I didn't know that there was no way for you to have had a conversation about that that was really, truly going to get through because the only conversation that was expected was one of where, where you could be contrite and be right. begging forgiveness for yeah. having taken this action. Yeah. And so I would say that if you are, if you are currently in a monogamous relationship and you're thinking about wanting a shift to non-monogamy, it is, it is about having conversations and figuring out how to stay ahead of the ball so that you're not putting yourself in a position to have to ask forgiveness. Because in my <laughs> long experience coaching now, that is a tough place to work from in your relationship. Yes. That can become weaponized very easily. The back and forth over who did what first, mm -hmm. who took which action first, who wanted who first. So I don't want to be, I, I, I don't want to be a naysayer and say like, you can never make it work because here we are. We somehow managed to come out of all of that really happy, but it is, the, the honest truth that a lot of people got hurt along the way because yes. we didn't know what we were doing. Yep. And it wasn't just us. It was also how each of us was acting inside of our other relationships yep. and inside of our friendships and our larger community. Having the conversations early and often about what your relationship is and what it could be. I would go so far as to say that the reason we are here and strong and uh, healthy is that you insisted on having conversations about every uncomfortable thing that ever happened between us. Also, yeah, that's all my kink. The, all, so. <laughs> it is. But also all the good stuff. You like to reflect. You like to look at what has happened and then figure out what might happen because of it. So we had all these conversations about, so this, when you did this, this happened and I didn't like it and I felt this way. And um, if... If that's not okay with you, we need to do something different in the future. And that happened over and over and over until we found ourselves able to, um, well, until I found myself able to get ahead of some of it because knowing the conversation was coming meant, oh, I would then think before I acted. 
Anyway, yeah. uh, kind of off topic for the conversation, other than it supports the, um, yeah. Um, before, if you want non-monogamy, definitely talk about it first before you go have some. Yeah, it's not. <laughs> I think that's. You're, yeah. <laughs> I don't think I can put it better than that. <laughs> I, the thing is, cheating can happen in a consensually non-monogamous agreement too, because yep. cheating would be about lying then, about stepping outside of the agreement. But it is much harder to come back from having had a, 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 a um, an experience, a, especially physical one, but often emotional ones as well. Yep. Yep. And I will say that 12 years, so 12 years we're at right now. Yep. And I was running down the street this morning, like just for, for fun, for exercise. I wasn't like being chased by a bear or anything. Um, And I thought, wow, I am really, really grateful for this disaster we have been through because absolutely none of what I do, none of what, who I am and what I do now was possible without the immense pain that 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 what happened when I started this conversation, when I started the conversation, I hopped into the shower with my, un, my, with my first husband. And I was like, I have feelings for someone. Isn't it wonderful? And the whole world crashed around me. And for years, I thought that I had, I thought that I had done the worst possible thing. But it was also the only way for me to become who I am today. I think you said it right. You started the conversation. Yeah. That conversation has continued and it's gotten us here. And it will continue to happen because we will continue to have the conversation. I really mean it when I say relation relationships are messy and that's good news. It is. Thank you guys for listening. I really, really appreciate that so much there will be many more this, episodes on this topic <laughs> this topic this is, is enormous and i'm happy to hear your questions you can always email me or ken it's jolie at joliehamilton.com or mm. ken at ken at joliehamilton.com because let's face it i'm in charge <laughs> and Phew. and it it will be our pleasure to answer your questions anonymously here on the podcast and if you have a specific topic to do with consensual non-monogamy, please feel free to suggest those as well. Love Happy to, to take that on. Thank you for listening to the Project Relationship Podcast with Dr. Jolie Hamilton. And Ken Hamilton. If you're enjoying our conversation, we would be so grateful if you would drop a rating and quick review so more people will be able to find us. And if you have questions or suggestions that you of things you'd like us to tackle, please send an email to jolie at joliehamilton.com. I'd love to hear them. Project Relationship, the Entrepreneur's Action Plan for Passionate, Sustainable Love, is available on Amazon in Kindle, soft, or hardcover versions. This book is a succinct, practical guide to improving your love life. I wrote Project Relationship to give you a set of quick action tools and conversation guides that can transform a mediocre relationship into a fabulous one. These tools are based not just on what Jolie learned in her studies, but on what we actually do to make our relationship thrive. Until next time, remember, relationships can be messy, and that's good news.